Okay. Let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Bonsoir. Welcome to tonight's keynote lecture event as part of Black History Month at McGill. My name is Shanice Yard, and I am a member of the equity team and the Black History Month Planning Committee in the Office of the Provost and Executive Vice President Academic. So thank you so much for joining us tonight for our eighth annual celebration of Black History Month at McGill. It's really exciting. And so we hope you enjoyed the reception this evening. Um, we're really happy to invite a new, at least new to us, Black-owned restaurant uh, to McGill, Resto Palm. And so if you enjoyed the food, please do support them by going to the restaurant or um, having them cater your next event at McGill. Um, also, welcome to the people who are joining us via um, live stream. So we are in the, the time of technology, which is amazing. And so folks are able to gather and join with us kind of across borders and in their living rooms, um, including my parents. So hi, mom and dad, which is great. Um, and thank you so much to the, the team who's making that possible. Um, it's such like an upgrade from the Zoom situation that we've attempted in the past. So we feel very fortunate to have this fancy setup. So a few kind of housekeeping uh, items for this evening. So please, um, I just double checked mine, put your phones on silent and turn off any set alarms you might have, just to avoid any noise disruptions for the evening. Um, please note that there are gender inclusive and accessible washrooms in the building located on the second floor. Um, so you can access them uh, up these stairs, most easiestly, most easiest. Um, and if the stairs are uh, a barrier for you, then the team here at TANA will be able to let you up this way, but we're just trying to avoid entry from those doors. So Black History Month 2024 features two events in partnership with our university libraries and the Department of History and Classical Studies within the Faculty of Arts. And I must just say um, an extra special thank you to the university libraries. We were really lucky to have a private and intimate tour this morning of the Roy State's Black History Collection, which was amazing. And it's open to all of McGill and also the public. So we really encourage you to check that out. It was quite incredible to see, um, again, what we have here and on display. Special thanks especially to Dean Guylaine Baudry, Dean Lisa Shapiro, and Chair Kate Devara for your support in making Black History 2024 a success. Thank you as well to, of course, the, the team here at um, and in kind of Tana Shulik Hall and the Shulik School of Music for hosting us two weeks in a row. Um, Thank you for your patience and helping us kind of coordinate and all of the logistical work on the back end. It's so, so appreciated. We are thrilled, beyond thrilled, to be welcoming Dr. Melanie J. Newton, who is actually coming back to McGill as an alumna who did her undergraduate degree here to deliver the 2024 lecture, which is titled, This Mess of a Colonial Legacy, Revolutionary Rel Relationalities, Arrivant Statehood, and Afro-Indigenous Futures. And so we are gathered here to celebrate history. And one of the most important things that I've learned is that to celebrate history, or at the very least to acknowledge it, we have to tell the truth. And that includes the truth of where we are and how we came to be where we are. And for me, this connects directly to some of the underlying themes of what Professor Newton will address later this evening. Themes of identity and relationship to land, to people, to community, across, again, time and space. In addition to the where, I am invited and required to reflect on who I am and that loaded and often messy question of where I am from. And depending on who's asking, will determine my response, how I feel about it. <laughs> um, and people are always thrown because I'm a black woman and I was born in England, so that always throws people for a little bit of a loop. I was born in England to parents who were also born in England and to their parents who were born in Grenada and Barbados, so I have an extra special connection to tonight's lecture. And I was raised in the country colonially known as Canada, and for the past almost 15 years, which is wild, I've lived here in Jojage, 
the city where McGill University is located, a city which is on the rich and unceded territory of the Gnigahaga. And this is land that has been cared for for thousands of years, millennia, and much, much longer before Canada became a country, much, much longer before McGill University became an institution. And all of this history is bound up with each other, as are we. And so I owe it to my parents and to my grandparents and to my ancestors, including grandparents who have recently become ancestors, to tell the truth, to demand the truth, and to not fear the truth, because knowing the truth brings us closer to knowing freedom. And so thank you for being here with us this evening. As I always say, it is surreal to know that we are in year eight, institutionally celebrating Black History Month at McGill, but long before 2017, there have been decades and decades of celebration and of honoring of not only our history, but our future. And so I'm guided by and indebted to legacies of black people who have come before me and many of us. And to those who are still present today and incredibly active and disruptive for their dedicated commitment to our freedom here and beyond. So I especially want to recognize, honor, and express my gratitude to the Dr. Kenneth Melville Black Faculty and Staff Caucus, the McGill Anti-Black Racism Working Group, the McGill Black Alumni Association, and student-led associations such as the Black Students Network of McGill, BSN, and the McGill African Student Society, MASS. All of these groups and the people who enrich them have gone above and beyond to serve us and to create powerful opportunities and spaces for us to find each other, to see each other, to love each other. And so thank you to all of you, and thank you as well to those who are organizing events across the campus. There's so much happening tonight. If I could be in two places at once, I would be at an event that's happening in medicine right now, but priorities, so I'm here. Um, so there's so much scheduled, so please check it out. So much work goes into the organizing, and so it's wonderful if you can support and put things in your calendar and show up and to support people who have put in that work. And you can visit mcgill.ca slash Black History Month to learn more about those events. And if you are organizing an event that you want us to, to add to that community calendar, please do send it my way, and we'll get that up on the website. More thank yous uh, to the comms team across the university. Um, again, to the multimedia uh, team tonight, who is making it possible for us to, to join virtually, or to have people join us virtually. Thank you for spreading the word and keeping us connected. Thank you to Leona Carthy, who's the designer of this year's beautiful graphics, and to Nicolas Debros, who is our event photographer, um, who's capturing the memories, and again, one of the things that we learned this morning, which is like the importance of archiving. So it's so wonderful to have, to have that as part of the celebration. And thank you most importantly, and always, 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 to all of the people who are tirelessly working behind the scenes to coordinate the logistics, to clean the rooms, to prepare the food, to take care of the babies, and to ensure that everything runs smoothly. Your labor and that labor does not and should not ever go unnoticed. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues. So first and foremost, to the people who truly made tonight possible and this month possible. Um, first, Linda Blimo, who truly, yes, really deserves like a round of applause on her own. Who's also still quite new to McGill as an employee, um, but has really just like incredibly moved into this role and um, has really led in such a way that's, that's been so powerful to witness. To Antoinette Henry, who again, incredible. <laughs> to Karen Diop as well, yes, we love. <laughs> and of course, to Antoine Samuel Moffet Olavo, <laughs> who is not here because he's enjoying the sunshine in Colombia. So, Let's just pretend we are also enjoying that same sentence, although, you know, it's quite mild, so we can't complain. And thank you to our entire team, who's led by Angela Campbell and Tynan Jarrett, um, for their kind of lasting, not kind of, for their lasting leadership, for their support and commitment to equity work at McGill, of which events such as Black History Month and the events that we organize as a team are part of. 
This work is critical and it is needed, and I'm inspired by the incredible team that I get to be a part of and the people who I get to work with and learn from each and every day. So to close, I will finish with a quote because anyone who knows me knows I love a quote. And so this is from someone named Dante Stewart. Black people should not have to be perfect to stay alive, be seen, and be loved. Black History Month is not just telling stories of how we have been exceptional. It is about embracing the fullness of our lives and creating a world where we are free to be human. And so with that, I will thank you again for your continued support, and we hope you enjoy the evening and the rest of the month that lies ahead of us. So at this point, I am honored to introduce and to welcome Provost, Associate Provost Angela Campbell, who will say a few words on behalf of our team and the Office of the Provost and Executive Vice President Academic. Bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Quel énorme plaisir et privilège d'être ici parmi vous ce soir afin de continuer notre célébration à McGill du mois de l'histoire des Noirs 2024. I am delighted in particular to welcome among us Professor Melanie J. Newton of the University of Toronto, McGill alumna, Rhodes Scholar, author of many scholarly articles and recipient of multiple academic awards for research and teaching excellence. Professor Newton brings to us this evening the gift of her research through her keynote address this Mess of a Colonial Legacy, Revolutionary Relationalities, Arrivant Statehood, and Afro-Indigenous Futures. Professor Newton and I completed our BA in History here at McGill at just about the same time, but we didn't know each other then. Learning about her work in anticipation of this evening, I realized I missed out tremendously by the fact that we didn't get to meet during our BA time. But I'm very glad that we have this chance now for our life roads to cross so that I can meet her and hear her deliver this lecture and learn with her this evening. Professor Newton, thank you so much for being among us today and for spending time at McGill to share your research with us. A very warm welcome and thank you also to Dr. Simon Anderson of the University of West Indies or UWE, Cave Hill Campus Barbados, and Kevin Farmer of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society for being here this evening. It's an honor to be able to welcome you to McGill, and please let me express my gratitude, aside from the fact that you've left the warmth of Barbados to travel to Montreal in February. We're thrilled to be in conversation and community with you, not only this evening for Professor Newton's keynote address, but also to explore opportunities for collaboration and exchange be between McGill, UE, and other learned institutions in Barbados and the Caribbean. We carry out this work with you in alignment with McGill's many commitments within the action plan to address anti-black racism here at McGill. So as uh, the Associate Provost Equity and Academic Policies, I lead a team of incredibly talented, focused, brilliant, and compassionate colleagues, and many of them are here this evening, and they're at the forefront of McGill's efforts to prevent, confront, resist, and overcome social oppressions that present themselves in both direct and systemic forms within our institution. C'est un vrai honneur pour moi de travailler et d'apprendre chaque jour avec ses collègues. Au sein de cette formidable équipe, le comité de planification de mois de l'histoire des Noirs mérite une reconnaissance particulière pour tout le travail qu'il a accompli afin de présenter à la communauté universitaire la série d'événements prévus pendant ce mois, y compris la conférence de ce soir. These colleagues on the BHM Planning Committee are Linda Belimo, Karen Diop, Antoinette Henry, Antoine Samuel Moffat Alavo, and of course, Shanice Yard. And I want to underscore that this team and others in the Equity Office work with diligence to educate on anti-black racism and to foreground black excellence at McGill and beyond, not only in the month of February, but the entire year through. Alors, avant de terminer, je voudrais prendre une minute afin de remercier un collègue en particulier. This month, we're marking BHM at McGill for the eighth consecutive year. Every year since 2017, Black History Month, or BHM at McGill, has grown in terms of its reach and impact. Celebrations have reverberations that last over time and that echo not only across McGill, but through our wider communities. 
This is due to the vision, determination, ambition, and brilliance of our MC this evening, Shanice Yard. My colleague for more than seven years, I've learned from Shanice each and every day about what it means to show up for your work, your students, and for your colleagues with care, dignity, and with grace. Shanice is fierce, determined, brave, grounded, a beautiful writer and creative, and has boundless patience and integrity. So much thought goes into everything she does. She is a credit to McGill, and I am honored to call her my colleague. I therefore wanted to take this moment to recognize her and her work, not only in connection with this evening's events, but throughout her long time and consistent, passionate work at McGill. Thank you, Shanice. I'm not prepared to be the MC, and I think Shanice might need a minute. <laughs> Merci beaucoup encore une fois d'être parmi nous ce soir. Um, I really look forward to hearing Professor Newton momentarily. I have an event kit with like everything you need, but I did not bring a vase for flowers, so. Thank you so much, Angela, um, and yeah, the incredible team I get to work with. Um, what's my line? <laughs> uh, yes, okay, thank you so much. Um, we're just so excited for, for this evening and what's to come, um, and so much like brilliance that's here with us as well. Uh, so at this point, I'm honored again to invite um, Chair and Professor Kate Devara, who is the Chair of the Department of History and Classical Studies, of which we're partnering in connection with the Faculty of Arts, and so she'll bring readings from the department. It'll be a little less exciting. Euh, je vais commencer effectivement par remercier euh, Shanice Yard de l'invitation. J'étais tellement, tellement ravie euh, d'être invitée, de participer à cet événement ce soir. Alors, de, de, euh, remerci de chaleureux remerciements à ce niveau-là. Um, so, I think it's been said before, but Black History Month is a gift to us all. What other month brings to us such, electrifying, such an electrifying feast of creative historical thinking, writing, telling, and in embodied performance. Tonight, we get to listen to one of the most compelling voices in Caribbean history today, Melanie Newton, in the company of distinguished guests, Kevin Farmer, Deputy Director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, and Professor Simon Anderson of the University of the West Indies. I can also assure you that Melanie Newton's former undergraduate history professors from McGill are especially thrilled to see her returning for this keynote. More than one freshly minted professor in the department found teaching Melanie in the 1990s as terrifying as it was bracing. <laughs> Others were perhaps wise enough to simply savor the passion and the talent. Here's another little nugget. Of black, for Black History Month at, at McGill to inspire the students in the room. May there be more Melanie Newtons in the room. In 1995, and this is courtesy of uh, Elizabeth Elborn, in 1995, as a member of the Africana Studies Committee, Melanie Newton helped issue a ringing call for more African and African diaspora studies at McGill. The resulting highly polished report <clears throat> was entitled Redefining Our Priorities, Africana Studies and the Future of McGill. It called, among other things, for fundraising for a chair in African studies and for the hiring of black colleagues. The pioneering professional work 
is part of the institutional history of McGill, deserves it's in our archives, and it deserves to be reread today. Black, Month, Black History Month may be also a, a, a time to, to reckon. We're perhaps a little closer to seeing some of the document's vision take shape. Within the Department of History and Classical Studies, at least, Black history is indeed done every day. Undergraduates can learn about African diasporas, about racial capitalism, transatlantic slavery, about African Americans and the civil rights movement in the US, about black women in Canada, about the history of Haiti, about the history of the global 60s, um, seen from an African vantage point, and in particular as it played out in places like the Congo, and much besides. It's a kind of selected list. They can do so from scholars like, and in alphabetical order, Wendell Adjete, Sabine Cadeau, Pedro Monaville, Melissa Shaw, who inspire us all. I'm thrilled that our history colleague Sabine Cadeau, author of a prize-winning book on violence and citizenship in the Haitian-Dominican borderlands, will be responding tonight. I can't think of a better, better match. When I think of Professor Newton's scholarship, and her own efforts at institution building, and when I think of these new colleagues and the future that they would like to see at McGill and the rigor and power of their own work, I'm reminded, and I hope you'll forgive me for this thought, I'm reminded of the remarkable event that opened Black History Month at McGill a week ago in this very room. It was the performance by the Montreal Steppers. And by the way, how many of us knew, I don't know if he's here tonight, that Kevin Queeley, case manager in the office of the Dean of Students with another kind of brilliant historian. So in his words, as we stomp, we remember the feet of our people who through displacement traveled thousands of miles and stepping is a reimagining of the use of the body that was once only viewed as property to create music that we've never seen or heard before. The clapping, the stomping and the stepping was forceful, it was disciplined, and it was engaging, and it drew on the past to create future possibilities, just as I know the lecture and the response will do tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, yes, it's such a good reminder that we were here a week ago, which uh, this is the first year that we've, we've kind of done this. As I said last week, typically the keynote lecture is part of the opening ceremony, and so we had to, to pivot things around due to scheduling, but I think it worked out in such an incredible way. And yes, um, let's give another round of, of applause to Kai and Queeley, who um, is hopefully tuning in online, but also is a newborn at home, so I imagine is like in the throes of newborn and toddler hood life. Um, but again, it's just such a, a good example of the people who we have here. And for me, it was especially um, incredible to see Kyan in his element in a different way. And I could just envision him in those classrooms with those students and with those kids. And yeah, incredible. Um, uh, I'm still forgetting my, my lines, my words. OK. Um, one thing I also wanted just to name as well is how amazing it's been to uh, be a witness to all of these like moments where Melanie's connections here have kind of been revealed and it just keeps happening. And it's just, again, such a testament, I think in many ways to like the magic of, of Montreal um, and the ways that people are connected to this place and come back to this place. This morning we were walking over um, from the Black Student Space, which is an inferior building. We had a wonderful meet and greet with Black students. Um, and Melanie paused in front of the Arts Building and was just like, you know, I, the last time I was on those steps or near these steps, I was um, here for a demo and was, you know, had the mic in her hand and was saying what needed to be said and skipped class for it. So there you go, <laughs> radical to the core. So it's just like so special to have her back here and again, to like see those connections and the impacts of the black students this morning who are just so honored and excited to meet her and to tell her about their research and the, the setting that they're doing. So we're really just like honored to have her here and to have her come back to us as well. Um, so uh, continuing on, I'm really, really honored at this point. Just 
out of myself to invite Dr. Simon Anderson, who is going to come and um, again, bring some greetings and opening remarks and kind of lay the groundwork for us as we, as we move in to the rest of the evening. And I'll just share a little bit about uh, Dr. Anderson because there is much to share. Um, Sorry, finding all my papers. So Dr. Simon Anderson is, the, is a professor of population health science and cardiovascular medicine at the University of the West Indies. And we heard a lot about that background this morning, which again, just fascinating. Um, is also the director of the George Allen Chronic Disease Center and the inaugural co-director of the Glasgow Caribbean Center for the Development Research. Um, this is just kind of a snippet of, of his bio, and he'll share more about himself as well. But again, we're just so honored to have you here with us from Barbados, the island of my grandparents, um, and to be with here, here with us at the same time as Melanie is an honor. So let's welcome Dr. Simon Anderson. Uh, bonjour. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. I'm Simon Anderson, and uh, very delighted to be here. And I just wanted to say thank you to the organizers, to the, the team, for inviting me. Um, I, I feel like an imposter because, you know, Kevin and Melanie, uh, I'm not in the league <laughs> at all. But so I'm. Um, I'm a little bit flustered about what am I going to reflect on? What am I going to reflect on? But um, it's, 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 we've, we've talked about the, the, the weather since I've come here, and I thought, I'd, um, because I don't see very well, just allow me to hold my thing up a little bit. Um, uh, let me just paraphrase a, a nice poem talking about the weather. That I, uh, It's a Jamaican poet called H.G. Carberry, um, uh, and he describes... Um, the weather in this way. We have, we're talking about Jamaica, but it could be Barbados or Trinidad. We neither have summer nor winter, neither autumn nor spring. We have indeed the days when the gold sun shines on the lush green cane fields magnificently. And of course, that's me saying that, there are days when the rain beats on the roofs like bullets. But uh, today, it's, my, it's partly sunny, but <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> this is not what we're used to, <laughs> but you know we'll, we'll, we'll bear through. So in, in um, discussion today, we, were, we had lots of chat this morning, and I, um, I just wanted to bring greetings from the Glasgow Caribbean Centre, from the University of the West Indies, um, who's given me the opportunity to think through non-scientific non means um, of, of un understanding the, the past and the future. So in a discussion today, I realized that um, I was using the word reflection a lot. Of course, we were going to reflect. And, I, I think, and we were talking about reflection, and I learned that, well, there's reflection and awareness, and actually, they're like five and six, and Nigerians know what I mean when I say that. It's hand and glove, you know, can't get one without the other. Um, and the unconscious and the unaware may not be reflective. Um, if you can prove that, then it'll be, you know, even when you're sleeping, you're not reflective. It's not possible. Uh, awareness is therefore a necessary first stage for reflection. And I reflected on uh, the work of an influential author that I like to read. Um, he's a Bajan, and his uh, book is entitled In the Castle of My Skin. And in that book, he outlines a conversation with, with, among some children who were talking about freedom um, around the time when they were learning that the, for the first time that um, they were freed. And they had a discourse about what were they freed from and what was that freedom about and who enacted it and why was it necessary. And they had a conversation with an, an elder um, stateswoman in the community who explained a little bit about what it was, and they were like, no, she, she's joking, this is not real. But um, that, that 
um, sort of uh, allows me to think that you know there's, there's a reflection that's required in in learning. And uh, Joseph um, Raylin, um, in an article called Managing Learning or Management Learning, um, noted that it is through public reflection that we may create a collective identity as a community of inquiry, unquote. Um, so time does not permit me, because I'm supposed to do this for five minutes, to give a full discourse on how we might disentangle the uh, mess of colonial legacy, and as well unpack the historical realities, but they're realities nonetheless. But in, in arriving at a solution, one might uh, consider very briefly the impact that justice, and I'm talking about reparative justice, which has legal, moral, and political points of view, and depends on where you're from, um, we, we want to uh, be able to wait for the scholars and the, the academics to fully articulate what this means and what modes and pathways they, they will use. But allow me to reflect on the three areas that are significantly impacted by the horrors of the enslavement of humans, of Africans in the Caribbean, uh, the area of health, the area of culture, and, and the economy. Those three things impacted individuals for the last 400 years and still does. And if we consider as a case history uh, approach the problem, um, so let me speak about, for example, the Glasgow Center, Caribbean Center for Development Research. That center is a, is a joint initiative between the University of the West Indies and the University of Glasgow. And it is uh, co-located in both institutions. Uh, typically, centers are usually in one place, but this center has been designed to be co-located co co in both um, geographic areas. It was established in 2019 when a historic MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, uh, was uh, signed, which committed the two universities to work together. Uh, and this was in Glasgow in July 2019 and in, and in Jamaica uh, in August. And the MOU is really a series of recommendations that emerged from a report that Glasgow conducted on itself, Slavery, Ab uh, Abolition, and the University of Glasgow. And it was conducted um, in 2018, examining its link to the historical slavery. And the report acknowledged that whilst the University of Glasgow played a role in abolition, it received significant financial support from people whose wealth was derived from the enslavement of humans. Um, and so, in the um, ability to, in, in, in the modal uh, con consideration to restore and repair, we strive to use a decolonized, decolonization approach to the partnership that we have with Glasgow where the essence is not about the value added by one or the other, but the value shared. And so, um, via a coalition of the willing, we are striving to facilitate research work, especially in the area of health, coordinate uh, academic collaborations with other universities. And one of the reasons why I'm in McGill and have been speaking to McGill is that my first encounter was at an MOU signing between McGill and Glasgow. And from that point on, we have been working very closely uh, from the University of the West Indies with colleagues from, from McGill. Um, so um, one of the key things is that equitable partnerships, when enabled, come from the understanding that uh, I call it babies drink milk philosophy. So when we create things, when we have fledgling creations, we need to nurture them and to have a timely input of resources over time. And that, and that needs to happen in all the directions of the partnership. So if there are three partners, it needs to come in that, in that mode. Uh, and so if we reconsider health, for example, um, you know, diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease afflicts um, the Caribbean significantly. In fact, two thirds of, of Caribbean people uh, are um, either dying from cardiovascular disease or have had an event. And women con contribute um, significantly to society and bear a disproportionate burden of ill health. And so um, 
Uh, our Bayesian delicacies like fish cakes and our Jamaican delicacies like akin saltfish, and I can name others from other country, are very much linked to our history uh, and the 400 year, years plus of poor nutrition. You could say forced nutrition um, and, and a preponderance of salt and sugar, which is linked directly to slavery and, and to um, a dissolution of dietary options that people had. So we, we approached problems, understanding that, okay, they're, they're problems related to health, but there's cultural um, milieu that needs to be considered. And at the same time, in a transdisciplinary way, there's also the economical aspects that needs to be considered. And I, I'll give a last example of what I mean. Um, I always talk about the fruit, fruit bowl versus the fruit salad option. And the fruit bowl approach to transdiscipline is that if you consider the fruit bowl in your living room or in your dining table with apples, pears, oranges, etc., cetera, uh, it looks very nice, but when you eat an apple, you eat an apple. If you have, uh, eat from, uh, eat from uh, your, your, your salad, you're going to taste bananas in, on your pieces of apple and, your, and strawberries and everything. Everything is all mixed up. Everything is touching each other. That's the transdisciplinary way. And that is what we want to enable our uh, partnerships to, to work on as we try to solve the problem. So essentially what I'm, what I'm reflecting on is that there is a conversation that needs to, had about, needs to be had about the, the historical impact of slavery, uh, the historical impact um, of the lack of repar reparations, and of course the, his the, the need for reparatory justice approach. And as we, we design and think through those ways of, of solving that problem, we will carry on with partnerships and activities that try to strengthen, build capacity, and develop the region of the Caribbean. And of course, Caribbean people live in, in places like Montreal, in London, in Glasgow, and other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. Did you um, make up that metaphor about the fruit bowl and fruit salad? Did you make up that metaphor about the fruit bowl and fruit salad? Take the credit. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm totally gonna quote you on that one. I love that so much. It's so, so clear. Um, thank you so much for those words. Um, next, I'm delighted to invite and introduce Kevin Farmer, who is the uh, Deputy Director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Both of those are important. We're so, so honored that he is uh, joining us again, also from Barbados. Um, he's also a member of the Barbados World Heritage Committee, and he was site manager for the property, Historic Bridgetown and its garrison, and is currently site, member, site manager for the Newton Enslaved Burial Ground. Um, his research interests in archaeological legislation and methodologies to combat illicit traffic and cultural property saw him present at the periodic report of the English-speaking Caribbean at the 40th anniversary celebration of the 1970 convention. Again, so much more to say about, about Kevin Farmer and his work, um, but I'm really delighted to invite him again up to the stage to share a little bit more about his, his self, his work, and of course, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Melanie Newton. for obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, bonsoir, ladies and gentlemen, good night. And to the fellow Bajans in the crowd, good night. <laughs> to Professor Newton, guten Abend. Now, realize that my delve into my really bad German is but a nod to Professor Newton's BA in German studies um, at McGill University. Um, this early foray to me underscores her wish to understand why societies go to extremes to justify their existence by oppressing others. As such, that becomes a catalyst to understand her own history 
of native Barbados and the Caribbean region, formed by genocide, oppression, and colonial violence. Uh, but I want to say thank you. I'm going to not remember all the names uh, to Karen, Angela, Shanice, um, to inviting me um, to celebrate Black History Month at McGill and to look at the collaboration uh, between the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, and the two words are important, or else I can't go home. Um, to underscore and better understand not only the connection between Canada and Barbados, which is defined in a way by our national dish, which Professor Anderson reminded us does lead us down a particular road of ill health, but it comes out of a particular history. But to underscore the history and to better understand the history of McGill and Barbados. Um, how many in the room know that there's a place called the Belair's Institute by a show of hands? This is an informed crowd, I like that. But this is an institute formed by McGill that exists in Barbados and has been there, I'm trying to think, 60 plus years. Um, there are many Barbadians who pass the sign and don't quite know what is it there for. And as such, one of the outreach activities of my museum is to engage people not only where they are, but to engage them to think beyond where they are to see those particular connections. And it is in twofold. It's a connection born out of empire, and it's a connection that must be understood and, and explored in both a post-independence and in the sake of Barbados, a post-republic space, which we are still trying to define. Um, and I will nod to Professor Newton and, and her early work as, as what was called the, the Young Advocate um, at the then Constitutional Reform Committee. Is it in the 90s? 1996 yeah. 1999, under, under Sir Henry Ford at, at the time, which in fact, unbeknownst to the members of that committee, set in place the road towards republicanism. So I want to say thank you for that. But that is but a continuation of her advocacy. Professor Newton's continued research interests, whether from her seminal work on exploring the political reality and nuanced negotiation of self of the aspiring free colored population of Barbados in Children of the African Sun, explored at the time heretofore overlooked ideology of a class of persons oppressed in post-emancipation period in Barbados and beyond in the region. This wish to understand where you are and why may have been fostered in that environment of the early Barbadian educational system that seeks you to choose a career from as early as 11. For those, those of you who are Barbadian in the audience understands what I'm speaking to. The 19th century model of education that we have inherited and we still persist with um, through a system called the 11 plus exam where at the age of 10, you choose which, and note my words, grammar school you want to go to. Uh, it's a quite elitist system that almost pigeonholes you in a way. Um, for some who, who are gifted, they can see where they want to go and they choose, but most of us can't. At age 11, well, one wanted to play Lego and just run about outside. Kids nowadays probably want to do PlayStations and something else, I don't know. But what that has set in motion is a scholar who sought to give voice to the marginalized and is in fact a foundational pillar of her interrogation of historiography that seeks to expose continually the colonial project. Whether it's the forgotten history of the descendants of the original first peoples of the Caribbean or exploring anti-colonial ferment in returns to a native land, ingenuity and decolonization in the Anglophone Caribbean, she highlights that flaw in the Caribbean experiment of independence, my words, that in seeking to craft a nation state, there was an indulgence in its own myth-making. And to paraphrase that Barbadian writer of Canadian migration, growing up stupid under the Union Jack, allowed for the newly emergent Caribbean to retell the colonial trope of tabla rasa in the face of real evidence, the fact that there were living descendants of the first peoples in our islands. 
The creation of the post-independent state myth was founded on a projection of blackness, which acted as though the indigenous people did not exist, and where they were physically present, treated as obstacles to progress. It's timely to remember that in that colonial project, its bureaucracy moved administrators across its vast empire. So the protector of the Aborigines in the late 19th century Australia kept the title whilst being transferred to British Ghana at the turn of the last century, carrying with him the solution to the problem. That colonial project drum beat on, and it's that legacy that we must expose, confront, and change if we are to ensure a systematic change and new development of our civilization. And it's that call for a change that is weaved into the works of Professor Newton. In fact, speaking of drums and their beat, Professor Newton's work is a continued evolution of West Indian historiography that since the 1960s has explored and given voice to the marginalized living in and within liminal spaces. Hers is a school of Caribbean historiography writ large that critiquing that colonial project that brought and killed millions in and to the Caribbean. Her work is used to focus, to excavate, and tease out from the archives hidden histories and narratives to interrogate intersections of reparatist justice across time and space. The ongoing multifocality of her research contains a thread to the ongoing evolution in my work of Caribbean museology that utilizes its archives and collections to engage communities in telling their story. But like the museum, her work crosses the road and engages in real world public history and engagement, whether in leading, in leading the renaming of Dundas Street or calling out her own university to reminding readers of the importance of history as the discipline to assist in repairing past injustice. Given the attack on our discipline in the region and worldwide, history matters. History matters. As expressed by the often quoted anthropologist, historian, philosopher writ large across all languages in the region, Michel Ralph Truel, history is the fruit of power, but power itself is never so transparent that its analysis becomes superfluous. The ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility. The ultimate challenge of, my words, the historian is the exposition of its roots. It's that exploration, interrogation, experience, and use of that knowledge that will allow us to transform our society for the better as we seek repair and reconciliation. History is both guide and agitator, facilitator and sounding board. It's not binary in its interpretation for our histories are complex, intertwined familial knots across languages and space, and dare I say, messy. <laughs> Professor Newton's work reminds us of this, and whether it's free coloreds, first peoples, the epistemology of the Caribbean public intellectual, intersections of gender, or interrogation of the post-colonial Anglo-Caribbean as a prism of European center colonization and its legacy, the thread woven into, around, and through her work is to expose the contradictions and seek repair. Her work carries on the traditions of Williams, Govaya, Marshall, Newton, Rodney, Beckles, Drayton, Amir, and others to provide information to assist in the development of our civilization. It is a history which colleagues like myself, those involved in utilizing written histories to create exhibitions and create content in museums and historical galleries draw upon to interrogate the material culture to which we are asked to act as guardians and to recognize that without that interrogative research, our ability to tell the multiple narrative stories of our people remains difficult. And in exploring 
the mass, we will hopefully arrive at a full circle of repair. And that takes time. And ladies and gentlemen, because tonight is really not about me, and I hope I introduce myself enough, it's really about Professor Newton. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, Professor Melanie Newton. No idea what to do when I get up here. So, okay. Merci de m'avoir invité à partager mes idées avec vous aujourd'hui. C'est un honneur, 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 par horreur, honneur. And I think that's as far as I'm going to go. I do speak French, but to stand here in front of you and attempt to uh, pull it out of my head in this moment, I'm a little nervous, especially since some of my old professors are sitting here. This is an interesting reversal of rules. Anyhow, um, I'm very honored to be here. So I wish to acknowledge the land on which I work and from which I am visiting, which is the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And I am grateful this evening for the opportunity to return to this place where I once lived and learned, which has also long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. I acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which people of the world now gather. I also want to share um, an African ancestral acknowledgement which was written by black staff members at the city of Toronto, which I find quite beautiful and perfectly relevant in this context. We acknowledge all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants either in this generation or in generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. We pay tribute to those ancestors of African origin and descent. So I'm really, really grateful. I won't even mince words for being here. Um, I did not imagine as a student that this was a position I would ever be in. Um, and I really want to thank um, all of the people. This was a really formative place for me, both the people who I studied with, some of the children of whom are in the audience today, um, Mishama, Avery, I'm looking at you. I went to school with their, their parents, and it is deeply moving to me and deeply gratifying um, to feel as though I was part of a tradition that I hope gives you hope about your ability to transform this place and is a reminder that, in fact, the only thing that has really ever transformed spaces like these universities into something better than they are is the kind of work that you are doing. So I hope that I contributed to that, and I hope that someday you have the opportunity to say something similar to a future generation. And to my professors in the Department of History, some of whom are here, and some of whom I, possibly for some of the orneriness, I do owe some small apologies, but um, I really also appreciate you. Um, you know, sometimes McGill was not an easy place to be a black student, but... I was really fortunate to have professors who believed in me, and I do really want to particularly thank Brian Lewis, who's sitting right there, who I recall, this was a transformative moment, said to me once, why don't you study at Oxford? And I said, I would never get in. And he looked at me like I was an idiot and said, why would you think that? And I did, in fact, go to Oxford, but I would never have thought of it if you had never said that. And it is a reminder, I think... Yeah. and Cecil Rhodes paid, which I felt was also appropriate. So, um, 
<laughs> and I think it's a reminder to all of us here who are in the business of teaching, um, you only have to recognize, sometimes it doesn't take that much, just recognizing the humanity and ability of um, a student just once can change their life forever. And particularly if you're a student, a black student, those moments are so precious. So thank you for giving me that. I appreciate it. Okay, so I have been told I have 45 minutes, so I am going to proceed. Um, and just be patient with me, as I, because I, my eyesight's not that good, so I can't always see the little buttons, so there'll be little pauses. Okay, so um, my research, and you'll see there's been a slight title change. Um, so relationalities, which is a really long word, is now revolutionary returns, but um, the basic idea, the ideas are still the same, and you'll see why I made that change. My research traces intertwined histories of blackness and indigeneity in the Caribbean through the epic historical journey of the Garifuna, an Afro-Indigenous people from the Lesser Antilles. Garifuna history is cru crucial to a fulsome conceptualization of reparations for slavery and Indigenous genocide and reveals unique genealogies of the modern post-slavery state that lie deep in the Caribbean's colonial history. My analysis is grounded in the struggles of the Garifuna of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, SVG for short, and Belize and the Belizean Maya, drawing on the Caribbean's multilingual philosophical and intellectual traditions to explore Afro-Indigenous histories of decolonization. A few notes on the terminology that I will use today. The term genocide and the expression native genocide, which is the phrasing of the um, CARICOM reparations claim, which I will talk about in a moment, that term will come up frequently. I acknowledge that this is potentially quite distressing in the midst of an ongoing genocide in Palestine, especially for Palestinians, and I offer my words in a spirit of solidarity. While this is a talk about the Caribbean, I think some of the resonances and some of the deeper reflection that um, both histories and the present require will be very clear. I try as much as possible to avoid unnecessarily reproducing racist colonial terminology. In my own analysis, I use Antillians as often as possible when referring generally to the indigenous people of the Caribbean archipelago, and lesser Antillians when speaking about indigenous people, specifically in the pre-colonial and colonial era southeastern Caribbean islands. I respect Dominica's indigenous people's preference for Kalinago and the presence and the preference of many of SVG's and Belize's indigenous people for Garifuna or Garinagu when referring to themselves and their ancestors. It is impossible to avoid colonial terminology in quotations, and it is sometimes necessary to use that terminology to make a point about how certain words were deployed in a specific context. So you will hear colonial terminology like Caribs and black Caribs, which are quite pejorative terms, as the term for indigenous lesser Antillians, with black added by colonial officials to highlight um, indigenous Antillian people with African ancestry. And of course, terms like Indians and Amerindians as terms for indigenous peoples of the Americas and Negroes as a term for black people, especially Africans and their descendants. However, I won't use such terminology gratuitously. So the homeland of the Griffin of people once stretched across multiple islands and waterways of the Lesser Antilles. And the Lesser Antilles, if you look at this map, you'll see the smaller islands, the map in the center. Um, so the smaller islands to the right, sorry, to the right of the, your right, your right, yes, <laughs> my left, um, of the archipelago of the Caribbean, that is the Lesser Antilles. There are the descendants of several groups, indigenous peoples whom Europeans misnamed the Caribes, Carib, Caribbean, or Cahayib peoples, fugitives from colonization and forced labor in the 16th century Northern Caribbean or Greater Antilles, which are the larger islands that stretch from Cuba um, to Puerto Rico, just off of the island of Hispaniola, um, and African and, and indigenous fugitives from human trafficking, especially across the Atlantic world, and plantation slavery in the Lesser, in the lesser Antilles from the 16th to 18th centuries. 
In 1796 to 97, during the final so-called Carib War between Great Britain and indigenous St. Vincent, British forces set out to destroy Garifuna resistance, slaughtering entire villages and exiling thousands whom British officials viewed as too dark complexion to have, in the words of one pro-slavery British MP and St. Vincent planter, no original right in the soil of the country, um, as people indigenous to St. Vincent. The exiled survivors of this violence were imprisoned on an island in the Grenadines called Balisil. So on the, your right, my left, um, map you can see that is the island of St. Vincent and down at the bottom, um, outlined, if you can just see that, that is the island of Balisil. So the exiled survivors were, um, were sent to Balisil where almost half died. The British then re-exiled the, survi the survivors from Baliso to Roatan Island off the coast of Belize and Honduras. So that's over here. So Honduras is down at the bottom, um, and the, um, that is Belize uh, in the center of the map, um, um, in Central America. Today's Garifuna live mainly in coastal villages in the north of St. Vincent, which is the main island in the multi-island independent state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and along the Caribbean coast of Central America in Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. And you can just see Guatemala here and Nicaragua is off the map. The Garifuna are, in the words of anthropologist, politician, activist, and Garifuna elder Joseph Palacio, the quintessential Caribbean people. Their ancestral stories and memories encompass African and indigenous experiences of colonization, enslavement, and forced migration. Like indigenous people across the Americas, Garifuna ancestral homelands, itineraries of displacement, and processes of community reconstitution transcend the geopolitical boundaries that modern states have inherited from the colonial era, a reality that is uniquely complicated in the Circum-Caribbean, shaped politically and geographically by what historian Franklin Knight called a fragmented nationalism. In 2013, the Caribbean community, or CARICOM, a cooperative body of 15 member states, including Belize and SVG, hired a British law firm and established a regional CARICOM reparations commission to sue the governments of Great Britain, Holland, France, and Spain for reparations for the slave trade and native genocide in the Caribbean. That's the terminology of the um, CARICOM claim. That same year, in his book, Britain's Black Debt, Reparations for Caribbean Slavery and Native Genocide, at the end of a chapter specifically devoted to the history of the indigenous people of the Lesser Antilles, so it focused on the Garifuna, chairman of the Regional Reparations Commission, Barbadian historian Hilary Beckles, explained the continuities between indigenous Lesser Antillians' anti-colonial struggle and the CARICOM reparations case, and I quote, by refusing to capitulate under the collective military pressure of Europeans, the Kalinagos and then the Carifinas then kept the Windward Islands, this is the southern part of the Lesser Antilles, in a marginal relationship to the, the slave plantation complex for 200 years, and in so doing made a principal contribution to the freedom traditions of the Caribbean. This history speaks to the origins and legacy of the British official, official policy of genocide in the Caribbean. The native community experienced the full impact of this policy. They have a legal right to reparations claims. No legal claim is clearer, end quote. Part three of CARICOM's 2013 10-point plan for reparatory justice demands that reparations include an, quote, indigenous people's development plan, noting that the governments of Europe committed genocide against the native population with military commanders instructed to eliminate these communities and remove those who survive from the region, end quote. Martinican theorist Edouard Glissant conceptualized historical return as a choice to sit with, quote, points of entanglement from which we were forcibly turned away in Caribbean history. The question of reparations invites such a return in story and state practice to histories of black and indigenous entanglement as a necessary foundation for a democratic future in the Caribbean and the Americas. Barbadian poet, essayist, and, his and historian Kamau Brathwit Embrace the Caribbean's history as one of movement and rhythm, land and water, histories of the Middle Passage, island and continental space, and sp unspeakable violence and remarkable creativity. As Brathwit powerfully expressed it, art must come out of catastrophe. In his 1973 book of poetry, The Arrivance, Brathwit used the term arrivant, 
which derives from the Jamaican rural Afro-Creole spiritual practice of Kumina to en encapsulate African Caribbean diasporic journeys of survival in the Middle Passage between plantation and town, between islands and continents. Chickasaw literary scholar Jody Bird has taken up Brathwaite's formulation of arrivance as a way of accounting for Caribbean nations shaped both by settler plantation societies and the decolonial struggles waged by the descendants of African slaves. A 2015 essay by Belizean Mayan educator and Mayan rights activist, Dr. Filiberto Penados, um, captured the Caribbean's entangled leg legacies of indigenous dispossession and African enslavement. Since the 1990s, the Belize government has fought and lost multiple legal cases brought by Maya communities in southern Belize who have demanded recognition and respect for their ancestral rights to land and self-government. In 2015, in the wake of a major victory for the Maya at the Caribbean Court of Justice, which is a regional Supreme Court, Dr. Penadas wrote, I quote, the challenge for Belize is this, how do we create our own reality out of this mess of a colonial legacy? How do we give ourselves permission to think outside of the colonial box? How do we learn to value and respect our differences beyond the folkloric? The challenge is to build an inclusive society where all Belizeans can fit. It is not true that in the past things were better, that there were no differences, that we were all Belizeans and only now things are changing. What we had was a place in which certain voices were silenced, be it the African slaves or the Mayas. The inclusive and just Belize is yet to be constructed. This begins by recognizing the problem and dealing with it responsibly. And this need for prudence and responsibility is required in greater measure from people in positions of leadership. Brathwaite, Bird, and Penados point to the foundational role of slavery in the Caribbean's contemporary reality of embattled sovereignty and citizenship. Far too often, histories of indigeneity in the Americas and the field of settler colonial studies emphasize European indigenous relations and marginalize black histories and, black and Afro-indigenous relations. These siloed histories of blackness and indigeneity, to quote historian Nancy Van Dusen, make Afro-indigenous people sound, seem like the exception when the sheer number of Africans transported across the Atlantic would logically suggest otherwise. Histories of Afro-Indigenous entanglement are a portal joining severed stories of survival, and they connect this past to the modern history of struggles for slavery reparations and recognition of Indigenous rights in the independent Caribbean. So I first want to point out in the middle of the map, the sort of blob. This is a 1511 map um, of the Caribbean. Um, this is what the Spanish knew at that particular moment. So that is Hispaniola. Um, this is the island currently shared by um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Well, shared might be the wrong word for that, but it is an island with two states on it. Um, having arrived in the Caribbean in 1492, the Spanish perhaps first learned to fare African and indigenous political solidarity in Hispaniola in 1519. With the expansion of indigenous and African human trafficking, Hispaniola caciques, which is often translated as, as a chief, who had expected to be seen as huachiao, which is um, indigenous greater Antillean or Taino for brothers, so they expected to be seen as huachiao by the Spanish, turned against the Spanish. Between 1519 and 1534, Hispaniola witnessed the earliest and largest Afro-indigenous uprising in the Americas. The combination of a revolt led by Hispaniola cacique Huarocuya or Enriquillo and a Wolof anti-slavery revolt. In the 1530s, in exchange for recognition as a vassal of the crown, Enriquillo abandoned his multi-ethnic, multi-racial and anti-slavery solidarity, turning in at least some African allies and promising to return future fugitives. In the aftermath of this revolt, the Spanish imagined a system of governance that created two separate racialized colonial repúblicas, or republics, one for Indians, quote unquote, who were vassals of the crown, and one for Spaniards. The dual republics subordinated indigenous leadership to imperial control and enforced spatial segregation, making indigenous leaders accountable to the empire and ensuring imperial access to indigenous land and labor. The system of racial republicas ideally excluded indigenous people from the Republic of Spanish settlers, except as the wives, assimilated mestizo children, or servants of Hispanic conquistadores and pobladores, conquerors and settlers. 
Black people were meant to serve the conquerors and settlers republic as their servants and slaves. They were excluded from the citizenship, citizenship regimes of both colonial and indigenous communities. Africans and their descendants did not belong in the República de los Indios, or the Republic of the Indians, in this system. The system of dual republics proved impossible to ma maintain in reality, giving way to an idealized conceptualization of a sistema de castas, or caste, casta, or caste system, in which, quote unquote, race mixture reinforced white patriarchal supremacy, black servitude, and indigenous marginalization. The casta system preserved key principles of the republicas. While mestizos, people of white and indigenous heritage, could potentially be integrated into elite Spanish colonial society, people of mixed black and indigenous heritage were not supposed to exist. In reality, Africans, indigenous people, and their descendants crossed racial boundaries of belonging and community, challenging European racial categories and presumptions of black and indigenous incommensurability. Nevertheless, indigenous communities who accepted black fugitives or publicly celebrated Afro-indigenous heritage risked violent colonial retribution. Most dangerous were indigenous people like the so-called Caribs of the Lesser Antilles whom the Spanish had not conquered. So these are um, statistics on the transatlantic slave trade from the um, website slavevoyages.org, formerly the transatlantic slave trade database, which I encourage students, faculty to use as a resource, but um, this is a, a sort of um, a table based on everything in their, in their database. The European invasion of the Lesser Antilles began in the 1620s with the arrival of the English and French in St. Kitts in the northern Lesser Antilles and the expansion of the plantation economy based on Atlantic world human trafficking began in earnest in the 1630s. And you can just see here, if you look at this table, you'll see that around the middle of the 17th century, the numbers really start to escalate, right? For people enslaved on plantations, the Caribbean's waterways became part of a geography of fugitive freedom. Outraged imperial references to African fugitives living alongside or being absorbed and adopted into the Lesser Antillean indigenous communities of islands such as St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Dominica, Grenada, and Beque appeared in Spanish, French, and English accounts throughout the colonial period. While islands like Antigua, St. Kitts, Barbados, and Martinique became the 17th century slaveholding, human trafficking, and sugar planting colonies par excellence, St. Vincent emerged as a center of Afro-Indigenous survival, sustained and transformed by practices of adoption and pathways of fugitivity that made the island a potential haven for captives across the Lesser Antilles. Transcultural exchange between enslaved Africans and indigenous people characterized everyday life on plantations, documented by our European observers like Englishman Richard Ligon in his detailed 1657 account of Barbados. Many cultural and culinary practices that came to be part of Afro, Afro Barbadian and, in fact, Southern um, American, Afro American um, culture because of migration between Barbados and, and the Carolinas in particular, many of these things. Um, which were then exported from Barbados to other parts of the Americas by enslaved people, originate in exchanges between indigenous people and Africans. So things like the national drink of Barbados is Mobi, across much of um, the African diaspora in parts of the Caribbean and um, the southern US, the word for cornbread is pon, that is an, an, a word indigenous to the Lesser Antilles. Um, methods of um, baking cassava and extracting the juice from, um, from cassava to make cassava bread. Don't try this at home, cassava juice is poisonous, please. Do not take this lecture as an invitation to have your own little HGTV moment at home. Um, certain fishing, fishing and medicinal techniques and so on. Right? So these are well documented in texts like um, Ligon. Fugitives managed to cross the 192 kilometers from Barbados to St. Vincent, where black and indigenous transcultural knowledge of fishing and marine life and culinary, medicinal and agricultural skills learned on plantations would have helped them to integrate. In March of 1668, Governor of Barbados William Willoughby concluded a treaty with the Indians of St. Vincent's and Santa Lucia, stipulating that the Indians were to return such Negroes as have formerly run away from Barbados and henceforth surrender any fugitives as soon as required. 
But one French official warned that St. Vincent's Cahayib prefer to see 2,000 Negroes settled in their island than to see disembarking here only 50 armed Frenchmen. And another called St. Vincent the center of the, quote, Carib Republic, who receive these Negroes amongst themselves and regard them as belonging to one and the same nation. Within the early 18th century Lesser Antilles, French and British colonial authorities had to accept that St. Vincent's Afro-Indigenous people were a powerful and united military rival. This changed after the Seven Years' War, when France ceded Dominica, St. Vincent, the Grenadines, Grenada, and Tobago to the British. By the end of the 1760s, British colonists, previously so circumspect about the prospect of war against the Garifuna, now determined that the people of St. Vincent, not being people who could be entrusted with a separate, distant Indian settlement under imperial control, and not being people who could be absorbed as enslaved blacks at the bottom of the colonial order, needed to be eliminated entirely. William Young, a powerful Scottish Caribbean planter and commissioner for the sale of lands in the ceded islands after the war, was part of a generation of planters who viewed the Spanish-American Sistema de Castas as the most scientific model for managing racial difference in the colonial Americas. Jamaican planter, historian, um, member of the, I think it's the Royal, Royal Academy, can't remember the precise title, but very respected scholar, Edward Long, called the Spanish Sistema de Castas, quote, a kind of science in 1774. Young hired a mediocre Italian painter called Agostino Brunias to accompany him across the Lesser Antilles, painting pictures in the style of Mexican casta paintings of the same period. Brunias' Carib paintings, quote unquote, sought to depict in pure-blooded indigenous people. Now, before we come to those um, here is a kind of image that Brunius painted that sought to show and sort of idealize racial, um, sort of race mixture, quote unquote, um, producing um, a certain kind of um, gendered forms of beauty. Um, in most of his paint pi pictures, some of them paintings, some of them um, pen and ink, um, there are all kinds of subtle cues about the sort of, sort of patriarchal control of this system of mixing, about the production of sort of fetishized um, mixed race women, and then there are all of these carefully placed, usually on the perimeters of the pictures, very dark complexioned women that shows the proper place of um, um, black women and, and, and black people as people who worked in the service of this sort of empire of managed race mixture. So Brunias also painted, um, so quote unquote, pictures of um, people who the British called Caribs and sought to depict um, pure indigenous people. So you see an example of this on your, why can't I get this right, man? Your right. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so subtle clues in the paintings indicated geographic and racial separation from black people. The emphasis was on family scenes, particularly women and children, demonstrating that they posed no military threat and could be easily assimilated. By contrast, images of black Caribs, right, and this is a copy of one of Brunius's images because they were quite popular and widely reproduced by other artists, um, showed them as frauds, pretending to be Carib, living in the hills like African Maroons and not in settled communities. And a lot of the images, this is pointed out by an art historian called Mia, um, Mia Banieris, show um, um, black Carib or Garifuna women um, carrying this particular basket, which is um, used to transport... Um, um, produce in um, Lesser Antillean indigenous communities, and in almost every image, there is one woman who's dropping this basket and having to pick up things and, and put things back in, which is a way of demonstrating it's their fraudulence, that they don't actually understand these um, cultural practices. So these are deliberately sending messages that are meant to reinforce a sense of their not belonging. This image which some people might know as pacification of the Maroons, was reproduced for the first time as an engraving of the Jamaican Maroons signing the Treaty of 1739 with the British. By, and this was reproduced by Young's fellow planter, friend, and pro-slavery collaborator, British Jamaican slave owner and historian Brian Edwards in Edwards' influential 1793 pro-slavery text, History of the British Colonies in the West Indies. However, this image was originally an oil painting by Brunias, depicting the signing of the treaty between the British and the Garifuna after the First Carib War of 1773. 
This racial schema folded the Gryphona into a visual history of black violators of the, quote, natural and scientific racial and labor order of the Duas Repúblicas and the Sistema de Castas. As with the Jamaican Maroons or the federal rebellions in, in Grenada, rebels in Grenada in the 1790s, the logical British response was mass killing and forced removal. So now we turn, this is the history then that is part of the basis of, this, uh, of the reparations claim in terms of native genocide. And we return to the present and the place of this history in the modern reparations movement. So to be clear, I'm about to say some, some things that are, um, think critically about elements of, this, of the discourse around reparations, but nothing in my talk should be interpreted as a suggestion that the CARICOM reparations case is not legitimate. That is absolutely not the message to be taken away here. So the inclusion of native genocide in the CARICOM case is important, and it is essential that it avoid narratives that reinforce colonial conceptions of being in which Afro-indigeneity is an impossibility. The indigenous reparations aspect remains the least developed part of the CARICOM claim. Caribbean politicians' public statements about and most academic scholarship on reparations contain little reference to quote-unquote native genocide. A recent report quantifying reparations for transatlantic chattel slavery, known as the Brattle Report, commissioned by the University of the West Indies, only references native genocide where there's a footnote that actually includes the title, so this word is in the title, of Professor Beckles' book. Otherwise, there's no particular analysis of this theme. Point three of the 10-point plan for reparations which was a point on the Indigenous Peoples Development Program, notes that a community of over 3 million in 1700 has been reduced to less than 30,000 in 2000. It is not clear where these numbers come from, nor could they include Indigenous people in all CARICOM member states. The phrasing of Beckles' chapter on the Kalinago and the Gryphona might be interpreted as suggesting that the Gryphona have earned a unique right to reparations. The Gryphona are the only Indigenous people discussed in the book. Thus, arguably, it is not the Caribbean's history of native genocide that has led to their inclusion in the reparations case, but the Gryphona's special role in undermining slavery. A survey of indigenous state relations across the Caribbean raises questions about some CARICOM's, CARICOM government's commitment to reparations for native genocide. In Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Guyana, St. Vincent, and Belize, indigenous and Afro-indigenous communities have all fought are engaged in legal battles against their national governments, who often do not have any constitutional or legislative recognition of indigenous peoples within their jurisdictions. Even the framing of indigenous reparations as a case based on legitimate historical wrongs seems designed not to offend any CARICOM member states. The ambivalence of Caribbean states with regards to questions of indigenous rights in the region is reflected at the broader international extra-regional level. On the one hand, all or most CARICOM countries are, were early signatories to UNDRIP, the 2007 UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This distinguishes CARICOM from the world's big Anglophone settler states of Australia, Canada, the US, and New Zealand, all of which initially refused to sign UNDRIP. However, only one CARICOM country, Dominica, has ratified ILO 169, which is the UN Convention on the Rights of Indigenous and Tribal Peoples, the current version of which has been in force since 1989. Now, shock news flash, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and, and the United States have never signed on. I am sure you are surprised. Conventions like ILO 169 are binding international law agreements with more practical implications than declarations like UNDRIP, which are important in terms of shaping international norms of state behavior, but have more moral than practical force. The CARICOM heads of government spokesperson for the reparations case is SVG Prime Minister Ralph Gonzales. In 2002, two years after coming to power, Gonzales' United Labour Party government named Joseph Chateauier, the Garifuna leader in the final war against conquest, as SVG's first national hero. However, in 24 years in power, the Gonzales government has yet to make progress on promises to give land titles to indigenous Vincentians or protected status to Balasso Island, which is a sacred Garifuna site. 
The idea of repair for the Garifuna challenges multilateral institutions like CARICOM and the UN, which lack mechanisms for ensuring the rights of minority groups in one member state, let alone across multiple jurisdictions. CARICOM has no regional indigenous rights agencies. The political history of the Anglophone Caribbean, which had a federated state at the end of colonialism that famously disintegrated after a 1962 Jamaican referendum vote against federation, suggests that such mechanisms would face opposition from some of CARICOM's constituent governments. In 2008, UNESCO recognized the Garifuna's language, dance, and music as part of the intangible cultural heritage of the world. And in 2013, the UN General Assembly declared, declared the period from 2015 to 2024 as the UN Decade of Afro-Indigenous Peoples. In 2009, UNESCO worked with Garifuna organizations in Honduras and SVG and with the SVG government to re-establish contact across the Garifuna Caribbean world, sponsoring exchanges that brought Garifuna cultural practitioners and language speakers from Honduras and Belize to SVG. However, the UNESCO declaration inadvertently represents the Garifuna as a people whose language and culture deserve recognition and whose forced diasporization deserves respect and requires repair, but who do not necessarily have any currently enforceable or legal, legally actionable claims to territory. The citation refers to the Garifuna as a people living in Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, but it does not say where. There is no reference to the fact that thousands of Garifuna still live in St. Vincent, including in clearly defined communities such as Sandy Bay, Fancy, and Aoya in the Northern Carib Territory, ancestral Garifuna territory which has no legal recognition in Vincentian law. This is likely because the language, music, and dance cite cited by UNESCO survived predominantly in the diaspora, but were largely lost to those left behind in St. Vincent. The, situations account, the citation's account of the Garifuna history states that they were, quote, forced to flee from the Caribbean island of St. Vincent in the 18th century, which is an unfortunate way to describe people being rounded up, packed onto ships, and forced into an isolated penal colony where many died, after which survivors were exiled a second time. Arguably, there is danger in entrenching the inaccurate claim that the Garifuna fled their homeland at the international level. The most important regional body in terms of recognition of indigenous rights has been the Caribbean Court of Justice, which emerged out of the 1973 Treaty of Chagaramas, which is the same treaty that established CARICOM. In a 2015 ruling that is one of the most celebrated cases the CCG has heard to date, the court ruled in favor of the Maya and against the government of Belize. Since the 1990s, the Maya people of southern Belize's Stan Creek and Toledo districts, led by organizers from Santa Cruz and Conejo villages, have escalated legal efforts to get the government of Belize to respect Maya ancestral rights in the south of Belize. In 2004, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights ruled in favor of Maya groups who had first petitioned six years earlier against logging concessions and oil exploration licenses the government of Belize had granted in the mid-1990s over parts of Toledo District. In 2007 and 2010, Mayan leaders brought cases before the High Court of Belize on behalf of Santa Cruz and Conejo across, against the Attorney General and the Minister of Natural Resources for their continued refusal to acknowledge, respect, or work with the Maya to determine the boundaries of their territory. Abdullahi Conte, a prominent Sierra Leonean lawyer and former politician who had been appointed Chief Justice of the Belize High Court, dismissed the government's claim that the government became vested with the radical or ultimate title to the land when territorial sovereignty vested in first the crown and then the government of Belize. He ruled instead that a mere change in sovereignty did not extinguish native title to land, i.e. the rights and interests of the indigenous inhabitants in the land before acquisition or change of sovereignty. Conte's willingness to rule in favor of the Maya and against the government that appointed him is widely seen as the reason why he was controversially not reappointed as Chief Justice in 2010. In 2015, after further, further litigation in Belize and criticism of the Belize government by the IACHR, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and the UN's Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the newly formed Mayan Leaders Alliance, which is today the main Mayan rights group in southern Belize, Led the Belize, took the Belize government to the Caribbean Court of Justice and won. Having signed on to the court in 2010, Belize was now subject to CCJ jurisdiction. 
CARICOM leaders and the reparations movement have remained largely silent about this and other contemporary land rights struggles of Indigenous people. This silence has left the government of Belize largely unaccountable for the way in which it has handled the Maya case. In its bad faith treatment of the Maya from southern Belize, the Belizean government has arguably manipulated racial tensions in Belize, portraying Maya communities as racist against both the Afro-Creole majority and the Garifuna, and therefore Maya land rights as a threat to the tenuous sovereignty of Creole Belizeans. In June 2015, about two months after the CCJ ruling, several members of the Mayan Leaders Alliance were jailed after a Belizean Creole or Afro-Belizean man accused them of having assaulted him and unlawfully detaining him against his will. The MLA, Mayan Leaders Alliance, asserted that authorities in Belize allowed individuals like this man to behave almost like government agents, repeatedly and illegally occupying traditional Mayan lands and engaging in actions from which he had been barred by the court. The MLA defended their actions as a last ditch attempt to defend rights that had been won in the Belize High Court rulings and the 2020, 2015 CCJ ruling. The Maya argued that in permitting foreign, foreign oil corporations and loggers to repeatedly violate these rights with impunity, the Belizean government had shown a lack of any intention to respect the court rulings by which it was bound. Then Belize, Belizean Prime Minister Dean Barrow accused the MLA of having engaged in an action which had, in Barrow's words, lost them the moral high ground. Barrow also stated that the 2015 rulings did not create a state within a state. It did not set up a separate Maya nation in Belize, and it did not give anyone the right to use force to vindicate any claim they might have to land. The Prime Minister implicitly accused the Maya of racism in the actions that they the MLA of racism in the actions that it took, particularly the decision to tie this man up with a piece of rope. The government's ongoing refusal to work with the Maya or to make concessions to them regarding territorial boundaries in southern Belize, and this is a more close-up image of, southern, of um, Toledo district, um, has led to conflict between the Mayan community of Mid Midway and the tiny Griffina community of Barranco in Toledo district which falls within the territory disputed by the government and the Maya. Barranco's, Barranco's Garifuna elders celebrated the 2015 CCJ decision and historically supported the Maya in their struggle against the Belize government. At the heart of this conflict is the Belizean state's refusal to protect the rights of both the Maya and the Garifuna, and its eagerness to give resource rights to exploit the fragile ecosystem of the resource-rich Sarstun Temash National Park. You can just sort of see you can't see it that clearly here, but the dark green area to the bottom, that's part of um, Sarstun Tamash Park. So they want to give res um, resources in this region to US oil companies. The Belizean government ignores requests from the Maya of Stan Creek and Toledo to map Mayan territories in southern Belize. The government also bears responsibility for the precarious tenure of Garifuna villages like Barranco up and down the country's Caribbean coast, who face threats of various kinds from tourism and other development projects financed by foreign capital and sanctioned by the government. In all these ways, Caribbean states exhibit the anti-Indigenous structural violence at the heart of modern statehood in the Americas. Whether or not there is the political will in CARICOM to acknowledge this, or to create mechanisms beyond what is offered by the CCJ to hold states accountable, is unclear. However, for CARICOM's claim regarding native genocide to be meaningful, such mechanisms are essential. That being said, we must return, as Filiberto Pinado so poignantly put, it, poignantly put it, to this mess of a colonial legacy. CARICOM's case represents a powerful insistence that any reparatory and decolonizing process must acknowledge that the Caribbean genealogy of the state bears a specific relationship to histories of slavery and other forms of post-slavery coerced migration, particularly indentureship from East, Southeast, and South Asia. It is clear that in the modern world, Caribbean states are constrained by and repeatedly punished for being the nightmare of colonial structures of governance, independent states run by the descendants of enslaved people, by, run by the descendants of arrivants, who were never supposed to be citizens or members of the colonial republic, or worse still, leaders of their own republics. Caribbean governments, like indigenous nations across the Americas today, are embattled regimes whose degree of real control over their own affairs is subject to the whim of settler and neo-imperial states and institutions. 
Their existence and the citizenship of their people are rooted in histories of ongo and ongoing realities of exile and displacement. European neo-imperial, settler colonial, and Caribbean, as well as Caribbean arrivant states may share an insatiable and extractive hunger for indigenous land, but the capital that drives this hunger comes almost entirely from North America and Europe, and the profits have never and will never result in privileges of settler citizenship for Caribbean people. In the wake of slavery, arrivant citizenship is intimately tied to routine exposure to the existential dangers of undocumented migration to imperial and settler states. Blackness continues to embody the absence of settler protections, a form of precarity that lies at the heart of the embattled sovereignty of modern Caribbean post-slavery states in our own time. This ongoing forced unsettlement, the exact opposite of settler privilege, is the predicament of both indigenous and arrivant Caribbean nationhood. A Garifuna history of the Caribbean reveals not Afro-Indigenous solidarity as a contributing factor to Caribbean freedom struggles, but a foundational, intrinsic, and necessary precondition of the existence of any kind of freedom in the Caribbean. A case for reparations against European states for the slave trade and Indigenous genocide opens up the question of what a system of reparatory government, governments, governance rooted in the teachings of Garifuna history, where struggles for arriving and Indigenous freedom come together, would really look like. So... This brings us back to the picture from the first slide. In 2012, I was fortunate to be present when Garifuna healer Lucia Ellis returned to St. Vincent from Belize and joined a pilgrimage to Baliso Island for the first time in her life. When she reached the shore, she kneeled on the beach, pressed her hands in the sand, and wept. For me, as a non-Indigenous Black person, this journey to Balasso felt like a profound embodied connection with the Garifuna, but it also felt like the kind of journey that I, as the non-Indigenous Afro-Caribbean descendant of enslaved Africans who survived the Middle Passage, can't make in the same way. I can't pinpoint a specific beach where, or a definitive moment in time when, for my first ancestors in the Americas, one life ended forever and another began. I too am fortunate to be the descendant of survivors of a genocidal exile. I am not Garifuna. This particular crossing is not in my ancestral memory, but Balasso felt like the most tangible, lived, sacred connection to this other crossing that I have ever experienced. In the words of Edouard Glissant, to be unable to live in one's own country, that is where the hurt is deepest. This is the predicament of precarity into which the arrivant state was born and against which it struggles, the pre-existing condition of a compromised post-slavery sovereignty. Arrivants, descenders, descendants of both enslaved people and the indentured workers who replaced them on plantations, as well as Maya and Garifuna, are all to be found on deadly journeys, usually heading north as unacknowledged refugees. The arrivant state constantly and desperately tries to extricate itself from a possible future in which it cannot make a home for any of its people because it has inherited an unrepaired history of dispossession that renders home dangerous, then impossible, and then lost. Colonial empires who enjoy privilege and power as the reward for centuries of, in the words of historian Sherwin K. Bryant, governing through slavery, enslaving and committing genocide against Africans and indigenous people must be held accountable through reparations. But principles of governing through repair don't have to wait for them. A system of reparatory governance would center a commitment to return and repair for all people who descend from these twin histories of dispossession. In the entanglements of Afro-Indigenous history in the Caribbean, we can find the lessons to transform this mess of a colonial legacy that we have inherited. Then we might begin to remake the Caribbean's fractured worlds. And I want to end with this picture from that same um, pilgrimage to Bali, so in 2012. And here you see um, on the left in sort of purple and pink, Sylvia Sampson, and then in the middle, Lucia Ellis and Lucia's sister, Zoila. And they're all um, Belizean-born Griffina at this pilgrimage and celebration in Balasso Island. And this was organized by the um, Griffina Heritage Foundation, or GHF, and they organized this conference um, many years, this um, pilgrimage for people from the Griffina diaspora to return to St. Vincent. And in the background, you see, you can only see one of them, but there are guards who identify as both um, Carib, and, as Carib and Kalinago and Griffina, as well as Afro-Vincentian drummers, um, some of whom are um, 
of Griffin heritage and some of whom are not. And Zoila Ellis actually returned to live in St. Vincent and is one of the founders of the GHF. And with that, I thank you. Good evening, everyone. Just give me a quick second here to find my notes. But I think that deserves another round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Newton. What a powerful lecture. We are so happy to have you join us this evening. My goodness, I am just blown away, I think, also by the images. I really was touched, and I felt the, the emotions through the images, so thank you. My name is Linda Belimo. I am part of the equity team in the Office of the Provost and Executive Vice President Academic, and I'm part of the Black History Month Organizing Committee, and it's such a privilege and honor to now introduce Professor Sabine Cado. Associate Professor in the Department of History and Classical Studies for her reflections after Dr. Newton's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin. So I wrote something. <laughs> I, do have question, I do have questions for the talk. But I um, thought I would say a little bit about Afro and indigenous identity from the vantage point of the Greater Antilles. And I think that will give a um, somewhat of a larger, broader understand, larger picture of um, Melanie Newton's contribution. Historians rarely study <laughs> the Lesser Antilles, and if in fact you're discouraged um, from studying the Lesser Antilles, in some in some ways it's the almost as if it's the island without a without a history. You're not going to get a job if you study Saint Vincent. Who cares? Maybe Haiti, maybe the Dominican Republic, and definitely Cuba. But we don't we usually study the Lesser Antilles, which is why um, Tessa Murphy, who was um, Melanie Newton's student, who I met undergraduate student who I met in, um, in graduate school when I first met her, and this is how I learned about Melanie Newton. I said, this is an um, Irish Canadian. Why are you doing Caribbean history? Why? Why? Because I had Melanie Newton as a professor. And all she knew at the time was that she wanted to study the lesser Antilles, the smaller, the, the smaller islands. And actually, and interestingly, she has actually published a book on the lesser Antilles. And we covered the hidden histories of some of the hidden, hidden histories of the indigenous people, and especially the Kalinago uh, people. Um, so we are in a period in Caribbean history in which we're finally um, we, we're recovering more and more about the indigenous past, um, indigenous and black relations, and the Caribbean. With, um, indigenous people in the Caribbean are no longer just a historical memory not just, they were wiped out, because from the vantage point of Hispaniola, where I come from, indigenous people were, were wiped out. Um, and although we, we do know a lot more now that there was indigenous slave trading from the Bahamas, from other parts of the Caribbean, who were actually coming to, um, to, to, Hispanio, to Hispaniola. But for the most part, it, there, was, um, there, was a, there was a genocide. And so, and gen so we don't really deal with indigenous people in the, um, in Puerto Rico and in, in, in Hispaniola, as um, as living as living individuals, people who are fighting for the struggles. If if anything, uh, in islands such as Puerto Rico, we've also created some kind of myth making of the indigenous past as a way as a way to deny the African the African past. So this is kind of the, the this this is the work that. Um, 
that we have in the Carib in the greater Antilles, I think, when it comes to indigenous people, indigenous people. In the Dominican, the Dominican Republic where I study, the term Indio, meaning, in, meaning indigenous, um, the Indians, is a term that um, many people still use to deny the, to deny the, African, the African heritage. So, and, um, and even before the 20th century, Indio was also used as a way to deny the black heritage. So reclaiming indigenous identity in the Caribbean sometimes is actually quite, quite risky. And it can be a, a denial of the indigenous past, of the black past, not of Africa, not necessarily, um, so it's not necessarily a story of even black and indigenous identity, but black, but, but complete, a story of black, um, it's a story of separation. Um, it's not inter interconnectedness. So just to, uh, just to say a bit, just to say the, the politics of indigeneity in the, Carib in the Caribbean, especially in the greater Antilles, is an interesting story. Um, we also, um, more and more, and I, you know this, you're not talking about the DNA, but there's the search for, because in the greater Antilles, the um, indigenous people, the stories that they were wiped out um, through enslavement, through disease, um, there's also a search for um, indigenous people in um, indigenous DNA. I was recently speaking um, to one, um, to one of the scholars involved in that DNA, DNA testing, and I said, well, why not go to Haiti? Why, why not look into Haiti? You look in the Dominican Republic, but you're not looking into Haiti, because the story is this, Haiti is just the black place. Somehow, indigenous people were never there. I just said, well, I just think you, you'd, maybe you'd find more. So um, we are, so there is this history of recovering the indigenous past and the greater Antilles, but what your work does, and which I, what I appreciate, is to actually see living indigenous people uh, who identify as um, as black as black and indigenous, and who really remind us to this the persistence of history, the long indigenous indigenous black and black struggle that that began as early as as colonization, and that really ha that really hasn't stopped. In some ways, um, as I heard your talk, it made me think that you could do an intellectual history from this Saline to history to Hilary Beckles. How um, you know? Even you know, for those of you who do not know the, of the Haitian Revolution, uh, some of you are my students, you know. But now more and more people know about the Haitian Revolution. So I'm not even going to. But in the 18th century, in the 18th century, even before, so we're talking about the 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 descent, um, the struggle of, of Africans and their descendants to overthrow slavery. In the midst of that revolution, the Saline decides. And decides to call his army Ame Indigen. So, so very, so very early, early on, and this is the island where supposedly there were no more long, no longer indigenous people. But she starts to talk about the power of indigenous memory and how in black struggles for in black struggles for freedom, very early on, before before Haiti becomes a nation state, before the first Caribbean nation state, black struggles for freedom was already linked with. Um, with, with indigenous people. So, so the imagining of, uh, of a nation, the imagining of a community, the imagining of an anti-colonial, of, of anti-colonial, of anti-colonialism was, has been historically linked in the Caribbean with black and indigenous, um, with black and indigenous, is, is was black indigenous struggle. So that the, the, so that black freedom is also a fight for, for indigenous freedom. Right. So now I'm going to come back to your paper, to more to your paper. I just wanted to give a, a, a viewpoint from the greater Antilles in a way, but also to look at this long, um, the, the long durée. You know, your title I think gives me permission in a way to um, maybe explore my own Afro pessimism a bit. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to do that. Um, so I'm going to. It's, so it's it's not a critique of the work, but I want to um, I want to mention I want to um, think about the challenges we have ahead of us, and um, and before I do that, maybe I should also say it was so interesting, Melanie, to not see reparations in your title, because um, the paper the paper is um, about rep about about reparations, um, and in particular, reparation that actually brings us to what, um, to how 
African Americans and, and blacks in the 19th century actually think about reparations. Reparations as, as um, you know, reparations as something that is tied to land that is tied to capital accumulation and property, and property accumulation, which I think gets lost these days when, um, when everyone's talking about reparation to the point where it's becoming meaningless. Like, reparation, like, what are you talking about? You see, you know, so, uh, so, I, so while it's exciting to be in a per period in which people are thinking about restorative justice or thinking about some kind of repair in democracy, um, it's also interesting to think about how um, I think we, lo we sometimes lose sight of what reparatory justice is and what is it anyway and whether reparations is even viable in, um, in, in capitalism. So, uh, so I also sometimes even think we're kidding ourselves. What's, what, what kind of reparation are we talking about? So when you talk about reparatory governance, I just was like, I was really fascinated. Like, well, what is reparatory governance about? Everyone's talking about reparations. Right now we have reparatory governance. So, um, so I really would like you to, to talk more about that. But it seems like the indigenous story of, um, of black and indigenous, of Garifuna people, allows you in your, in your particular talk to actually give us concrete definitions of what, um, of what they are asking for, what the, de what the demands are in a very, very clear way, which, um, which I think some of the uh, studies on reparations are not actually giving us. So I really appreciated that I knew exactly what, uh, what, what this was talking, what you were talking about. And then I realized, oh, this is not even a literary imagining. She's actually talking about a real life, a real struggle that's actually taking place in our, in our own times in the courts. So, um, so what I'm gonna say, so, um, just, so I don't go over time, I'm just gonna give the questions real quick. The Black, this Black History Month, Melody Newton, draws our attention to the ongoing saga of the Garifuna people of Central America and St. Vincent, whose ongoing saga of forced migration, colonization, genocide, and multi-generational resistance makes the history one of the most remarkable examples of what we might call colonial shatter. Professor Newton offers a range of intriguing terms, which I want, wanted to ask her about. What, for example, is the special value of Braffrate's term arrivant as a descriptor for Caribbean peoples and Caribbean nation states? Is this an optimic, optimistic characterization that suggests that Caribbean nations are not better poised than before to reverse the ongoing damage that they have suffered from colonialism and neocolonialism? Does righting the wrongs of slavery and colonization and centuries of racial violence depend on the so-called reparatory governance that Professor Newton mentions? What does reparatory governance mean? And what opportunities do you see for Gary from the people to defend their land, culture, language, historical memory, and possible claims to sovereignty and self-determination? Professor Newton considers the post-colonial nature of Caribbean nation states such as Belize and St. Vincent. And I wonder to what extent she, do you see the Garifuna people struggling for reparatory governance within these states or against these states? One question that relates to my work is the question of locating and defining instances of genocide within Caribbean history. I'm certainly interested in the argument that the mass confine, confinement and murder of Garifuna people on Balisot Island in the 1790s amounted to a colonial genocide. Which is interesting because this is also around the same period that Napoleon also wants to, um, dis, wants to get rid of, exterminate Africans and their descendants in Haiti during the Haitian Revolution. And this is just the period of the revolution. It also made me think about the indigenous um, struggles in Bolivia during um, this period, Tupac Amaru, the whole Indian, Indian um, struggles, indigenous wars. So this is also a very critical period. On the special question of the interrelated phenomena of the Garifuna, the Kalinego, and I know these terms are 
pejorative. So anyway, as inter, um, intilian is what you use, intilians, <laughs> okay? As interrelated categories of Afro-Indigenous peoples of the Lesser Antilles wanted to explore the overall question of Black Indigenous relations and Black Indigenous creolization or hybridity in the history of the Americas. To what extent is anti-colonial racial solidarity a hopeful discourse among intellectuals, radicals, and activists, one which often comes up against the less heroic realities of narrow ethnic, regional, political, financial, and national interest among particular colonized and racialized peoples. Solidarity is a big idea with its own and inherent logics, but divide and conquer may well be the bigger and more powerful idea. I told you my Afro-pessimism was coming in, and when you have a title, this colonial mess, you, you, you've given me permission to. Are the other are revanche small Caribbean nation states that Professor Newton discusses realistic forces for post-colonial for post -colonial repair and redemption? Are they post-colonial entities moored firmly to political and economic realities inherited from the colonial era? Even in the cases of St. Lucia and Barbados, where leaders such as Mia Motley have been prominent proponents of the reparation cause, how much can any of those small states, can any of those small states do to stand against or outside of the power of the imperial countries and the multinational corporations that tower over these small governments? By now, you may fear that my comments reflect so-called Afro-pessimism. But as a historian of the African diaspora in the Caribbean, I think we have to strive to, to, close, to stay close to the facts and to consider heroic resistance and struggles for black power alongside the troubles, obstacles, disadvantages, zero-sum logics, and complex ambiguities that have reliably accompanied anti-colonial struggle. I see these, rea these realistic, less than heroic histories in many of the grim Maroon treaties that were signed obliging Maroons to return runaway slaves and put down slave rebellions. And I observe the pyrrhic dimensions of anti-colonial victory in the aftermath of the Haitian Revolution when Haitian independence gave birth to a country that was harbored by civil war, encirclement, neocolonialism, gunboat, gunboat diplomacy, and crippling debt. I agree with Professor Newton that, I'm so sorry about this pessimism, you guys, but we've got to get to it. Because you want to get to, you know, so David Scott, colonial disenchantment. It's just, we, I am disenchanted. <laughs> so um, I agree with Professor Newton that the history of the Garifuna represents one of the most, one of the more important topics in the entire history of the Caribbean. But when we consider British colonial power, we notice that the 1790s, the age of the Haitian Revolution, witnessed one of Britain's greatest military innovations, the creation of an enslaved fighting force, the Black West India regiments, whose effective deployment helped Britain win multiple battles throughout the Caribbean. They are involved in the suppression and, and exile of the Garifuna, with the Black soldiers of the St. Vincent Rangers forming one of the prototypical units that would be organized into the West India regiments. As with everything, the Black West India regiments were potentially a double-edged sword, as they would sometimes raise rebellions and mutinies in the Caribbean. But their successful deployment demonstrated the empire's dexterous use of enslaved, racialized troops to undermine and defeat free Black Caribs in Garifuna. On the question of the Garifuna as a historical case of Afro-Indigenous hybrid ethnogenesis, I propose we consider the wider comparative complexities of Afro-Indigenous relations in the, regions, in the region. Are Blacks and Indigenous people in the Americas historical allies, drawn together by related histories of European colonization and enslavement? At times, they clearly have been, but like everything else, the history is complex and dynamic. Along with the Garifuna, perhaps one of the most historically prominent black indigenous peoples to have emerged from the shadow of colonialism were the Seminole people of Florida. Fighting together against slavery and colonization for centuries, the Seminoles survived against terrible odds in Florida, where some of them still have some treaty rights and some casinos. But among the group that was relocated to the Seminole Reservation in, in Oklahoma, the 1990s witnessed a tragic history of betrayal and divide and conquer, 
when tribal leaders discovered the potential to receive a new influx of federal funds, they organized to formally exclude black Seminoles from the tribal membership so that the funds could go further in supporting the real Indians. Centuries of racial hybridity, alliance, and common cause were undone by narrow economic interests and historic heroes of anti-colonial struggle demonstrated that they too were susceptible to the wider phenomenon of anti-black racism. On the other side, in Panama and other Latin American countries, when indigenous land claims stand in the way of mines or other development projects, how reliably do black citizens support the indigenous cause? And how often are they likely to adopt the wider view that native land claims are inconvenient barriers to economic growth? Historically, indigenous people are not immune to anti-black racism, and blacks have at times been fellow travelers or lesser participants in the white-led economic activities that so often come up against indigenous land rights. And so I'm gonna stop there, but just say one thing about the Maroons, since you, since you mentioned the Maroons. I, uh, I believe in Jamaica right now, there's also uh, maroon um, claims to land rights, to land, ter to land territories. And so the Caribbean seem to be um, get getting it from um, Afro-Indigenous groups and including maroon groups. And when, in the case of maroon groups, some Jamaicans are even saying, you guys were the traders. And now you're asking, now you're asking for land. You're not going to get the land. So it's, so it's interesting to see um, Caribbean, um, Caribbean states really dealing with that, um, with that past and also the present, um, the present, um, the present. so there's the, the struggles for land from both indigenous uh, people, uh, people indi Afro-indigenous people, but also from black Maroons. Sometimes um, Maroon communities are also linked with, they're also Afro-indigenous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Caddo, for those powerful reflections. We're now gonna open up the floor to q and I know in the essence of time, if some of you have to run, I do apologize. We are only going to take two questions. And I want to welcome now to the stage, Mishama Iyab Austin, the president of the Black Students Network and Dr. Newton to join me. Please join me in welcoming them again. Can you guys hear me well? Okay, good. Good evening. Thank you to everybody who's here. Thank you, uh, Professor Cadeau, for the reflections. And thank you, Professor Newton, Auntie Mel. <laughs> um, it is such a privilege to hear you speak. It's weird, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but it's a gift um, as a black student, especially being part of the BSN, to be able to sit here and hear one of the McGill alum, but specifically BSN alum, who's had such an instrumental role um, in shaping things here at this school. So thank you. thank you. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I just wanna invite whoever has questions, you only have time for two questions, to come down and ask them in the mic right here, next to Shanice. Um, yeah, two people, whoever, is there, maybe I can, no. I can also start off with a question if needed. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes, there's also a mic there, sorry. Um, hello? Not sure if you can hear. Um, hello, thank you so much for your talk, Professor Newton. Um, it was really interesting. My question was surrounding why you chose Afro-indigeneity as your site of research and what inspired that choice. Hmm. Oh. oh my, hang on. Can we? Okay, yeah, we'll start this one. Yeah. Um, so thank you. And I also want to acknowledge that this is also the daughter of people I meant to McGill. <laughs> Sorry, I did not plan these questions. Um, <laughs> um, and I can also see people I went to McGill with. Hi, Sylvie. Um, 
Okay, so thank you for that question. Huh, where to start? So when I first, so I guess like so many people who, I didn't study the Caribbean in, um, in undergrad. Like I, my first degrees in German studies, the, my, my minor was um, British Imperial history. And I came to, and I won't go into the long story there, but I did come to be very interested in some of the questions that I was exploring in German history and in British history, thinking about some of these in relation to the Caribbean. Um, and I also, very briefly, I, was, I also worked at the McGill Daily. Um, and one year we did a special issue on, on labor because you know we were the daily, <laughs> that's what we did. And um, I wrote an essay, I wrote a, a, an article on the Grenada Revolution, which um, I, re and it, it, a memory came up of the morning of the invasion because I'm from Barbados and I was nine when the invasion happened. And I do remember we, in the weeks leading up, we were like one of our school trips was to a US warship. And um, there were like, US troops, smartly, as they had the troop build up, they left from Barbados and went to Grenada. And I remember the morning of the invasion hearing the helicopters as they were leaving. And it was earlier in the morning, so we knew what was happening. So it's a very powerful sort of visceral memory. Um, why am I getting so emotional? I don't usually do that. Um, but that was really a, a really pivotal moment. And then um, when I was teaching at U of T, I remember there was this one class, I'll never forget this. It was 2004 and there was a student, I won't say her name, she was a Mohawk student. She always sat in the front. She was so keen, she was so interested. But I had also learned all of those narratives about you know, sort of indigenous people you know, having all been killed and so on. And when I first started teaching here in Canada, and I'd see my students writing, using the word natives in their papers or, and so on, and I would circle it and say, who's native to the Caribbean? Who's indigenous in the Caribbean? And then I'm like, where the hell are they getting this stuff from? And I'm realizing, you know, it's coming from the stuff I'm teaching them. So I started to realize, I want to think about this differently. So I started looking for material and so on. But then I remember there was one class where, you know, you're always in a hurry writing your lectures, which maybe students, maybe you realize and maybe you don't. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's more obvious than other times, I imagine, but I had meant, I was like, I always was like, I mean to do this and I mean to like really make an effort and change what I say because I would write out my lectures and so on. And I remember I got to that point in one of my lectures where I spewed out that line about, you know, sort of the killing of all indigenous people in the Caribbean. And as I'm saying it, I'm sort of looking at her and I remember this feeling of just, I felt so awful because I knew having you know, studied as an undergraduate, like the history of the Holocaust, having studied the history of slavery, having, like I knew, I said, this does not make any sense. The way that genocides work, it's a lot of work to kill everybody. They don't kill everybody. They just make it so that, what the, the greater power is to make it so that nobody believes survivors when they say who they are. That's the real power in genocide, is to make it so that people's stories of survival don't even matter beyond their own memories. So I, knew this to be true and yet here was this narrative. And I, I swore, I remember standing, I was like, as I was saying this and thinking, this is the very last time that I will ever say this. Like I, I need a different, there has to be a different story because this does not make any sense. And so I started to think about it and I started, and, and then like the minute, it was funny, the minute I started to just talk to people I knew in the Caribbean who are like, about, well, I'm thinking I'm gonna research the indigenous Caribbean. And then the numbers of people who I had known all my life who said, oh yeah, well my, you know, cousin is uh, quote unquote Carib or, you know, like, and there's a, there's an element, there's a little bit, it's a little bit like, um, you know, the, the idea that, oh, my, like in the United States, like my, my grandmother was a Cherokee princess, so, which has a really complicated history as well. Like there's a, you know, a bit of an element of, you know, this being a, a bit of myth making, but there's also a certain complicated truth, even to that Cherokee history, by the way. Um, but, there's a certain, but there was a certain complicated truth and the ubiquity of these responses um, really made me realize, you know, these are people, they've grown up with these stories in their families. They are taught not to, like it's never gonna come up unless they're speaking to someone who they think is not going to laugh at them. But the minute you show that you might take this seriously, people will tell you. you know, and people I would have known all my life if I had never said this would never have told me. So that's what sort of pushed it forward. Um, and then I sort of got to meet these amazing Garifuna people and Garifuna women. And now do know, like, like you know, in terms of people who are Maya and activists and people who are working in Saren, so across the Caribbean and just the, 
the, the term that one scholar uses is an indigenous resurgence in the Caribbean, where people are, you know, um, making these claims to the government and demanding this, um, this full acknowledgement of this presence um, in all kinds of ways. And I think that, again, this is part of a basic struggle for democracy in which I also see the reparations movement situated. That if we don't come, we, there is no democracy without coming to terms with this history in a full way. If we want to have a future, that is where we need to go. And so for me, one of the of responses I would say is, um, you know, I'm not necessarily, I'm not a pessimist, I'm not an Afro-pessimist, I'm also not someone who believes that um, the future is ne necessarily, the arc of the universe tends towards justice. Um, but I do think that um, people don't accept repression quietly, and systems of repression invariably produce the people who are in many ways best placed to challenge them. So I think that there will always be that dynamic. So the systems under which we live and which I'm des describing, which I think are also constraining, but also shaping the thinking of Caribbean heads of government, um, who the mother of a friend of mine used to call the hogs, um, heads of government, hogs, um, that, you know, it's never, governments will just never have it their own way, however hard they try. So I do think that, um, yeah, that, that, that's my answer to your question of how I got there. <laughs> but I, I also see, like in this, like this moment, like in this picture, um, where I was also, I'm, sta I'm standing next to the photographer who's someone I happened to have worked with many years before. And I have to say, it's hard to go through an experience like that and not be hopeful. Because these are people truly who are not supposed to exist. Mm -hmm. right? This is a moment that was never supposed to happen. And yet there it was. Right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. I, I saw some people standing before. Um, so thank you so much for that really wonderful um, lecture. It was a pleasure to listen to you speak. Um, it was really moving and, and revealing, clear and nuanced and, and complex, um, intimate and also from a large uh, viewpoint onto to history. Um, it really you know, inspired me personally because I, I mentioned to you before when we were speaking that I've been working on reparations and I'm starting to look into a, a piece that um, deals with some of these issues really. Um, and I thought part of the title of the, of the paper that I may write would include suspending disbelief the idea of suspending disbelief in Caribbean states and even African states and regions in calling for reparations from, from Europe and also the United States. And so while these claims are going on from heads of state and the region, you may know that the African Union and CARICOM recently announced this summer that they're joining ranks once again since they did that previously in 2001 in the Durban Conference and so on. Um, and calling for a global reparations fund. Um, and that kind of partnership of these immense regions just spoke to me very clearly about, well, what are the prospects for reparations for people on the ground, for communities, African indigenous communities, Maroons, um, but even communities who are living within cities. Right? and who require structural justice of healthcare and education and the like. Um, and so I guess it's returning again to the question that's been asked so far about, you know, what is the prospect for what you've called the arrivant state, right? The post-colonial state that has taken on many of the same structural tendencies of the colonial uh, inheritance. Yes, resource extraction, but also continuous engagement with the international economic system. If we think about Mia Motley, for example, right, our engagement with the IMF, um, such that there hasn't been a delinking 
from the fundamental structural issues and practices that subordinate indigenous people and black people globally. Um, so, you know, does democracy solve that issue? Or um, if, for example, the Garifuna received reparations in a sense, an anti-imperial sense, would the state still be the state as such? Or would we understand it very differently? Thank you. Um, I feel I'm probably not gonna do that question justice, just because I think we're all, you know, as we live through, so I, I think the reparations movement um, is a, even if it's not necessarily what these governments want to think it is, it is a fundamental challenge to the idea of governance or statehood that we have inherited. I think there, there is an inherent um, suggestion that some, some really basic transformations of a kind that possibly, you know, people like my age, I mean, I'm gonna be 50 this year, party at my house. Um, <laughs> you know, I like to think I'm a very imaginative person, but I also like to think that there are changes coming in the world that are good changes that I am not able to imagine um, or can only dimly imagine in this sort of near possible future, um, assuming we have a future, right? And I think, um, so I think that question of, you know, the settler state, the imperial state, you know, the arrivant state, um, and I'm not a big person for coining um, neologisms, like I'm not really, but I, did, I do think that really recognizing, like it seems like there's a struggle in some scholarship to even hold a place for what the Caribbean represents as a form of statehood. Like, you know, just sort of, again, folding it into the category of settler colonial, folding it into, you know, like there's just, they don't know what to do, or people don't know what to do. I'm like, well, it's, it's its own thing. Like slavery is a basis of state formation and it produces a very particular kind of state in situations where that, that was the condition of the majority of the population and that is the heritage of the majority of citizens. That is, a, that is different from, um, while the condition of being an arrivant may be shared in, by many people across the Americas, that condition of statehood is a very particular thing. So um, I think this, this term, and so many of Brathwaite's ideas are powerful in terms of expressing that. Now, do I think that that is necessarily um, a state form that will, would be in a different and better kind of future? Not necessarily, but I think a, naming it as a specific kind of state form is essential for us to get, to get there. And I think this is also to me, again, one of the truly revolutionary ideas in reparations that I'm not totally sure even that some of the government leaders who talk about reparations would think that way. These are, these are certainly not people necessarily thinking about you know, sort of revolutionary social change. Um, but I think it, the, the, their, their inability, I think their, this, the sense of their own limitations and this, the sense of the kind of, the depths of the crisis they face, that is real, right? That is real. And I think, um, I would also say that you know, okay, just to tell a really short story. On this, I think either this trip or a subsequent one to St. Vincent, I can't remember the year. I happened to be in the airport and I was on my computer and this young man, young black man, sat in front of me and just stared at me. And at first I thought, well, this is creepy. But then there was nothing really predatory. He was just looking at me like he was waiting. And I finally looked up and he goes, you gonna work all evening? And I was like, well, I guess not. And I closed my computer. <laughs> And we ended up sitting next to each other on the plane. And he was actually, he, had, he, was, he was born in St. Vincent, had a Barbadian father, had grown up in Barbados, so had a Barbados passport. And because he had these two passports, he was able to move back and forth um, as a marijuana boat captain. Um, so besides the fact that I thought, this is really fascinating and I do not want to go through customs with you. <laughs> because I think that's gonna be real complicated. <laughs> but the way that he described that relationship, like the journey between Barbados and St. Vincent, the way the tides work, you know, like just the currents and how, like how you navigate them to travel between these two countries. 
um, how important that journey clandestine at night is to people. And, and if you stand on one island to the next in the Lesser Antilles, you can see, with the exception of Barbados, but many of these islands, you can see the next island beyond. And I just think about the ways that ordinary Caribbean people like this man, they make their living by defying, like they're constantly trying to recreate without even necessarily realizing it, the map of the Caribbean that colonialism destroyed, which was a map in which people lived on the sea, in which the sea was not just a marker between sort of rival jurisdictions. It was a place of living. Um, it was a place that connected other spaces of living. And so I sort of, I recognize like the, the sort of pessimism of the limit, limited vision of Caribbean leaders who I think going back even to the Haitian Revolution have really in some ways never trusted that kind of vision of their own people. This is in so many ways at the heart of the struggle of state against nation, not just in Haiti, but across the Caribbean. That, you know, leaders often, they, they recognize that their people have a vision of freedom in which they probably don't pay a play a role and distrust that. But that, again, that doesn't go away, right? And um, I don't know. I, I, I think about, like, so fa for Fanon, like Franz Fanon once said, I can't remember where, but he was critiquing negritude. Um, and he was like, you think there's solidarity between black people across Africa and the rest, and across the African continent, and between Africa and people outside of Africa because we share culture? No, absolutely not. Like, you know, we don't, like he's, he's like, that's, culture is not a basis of political solidarity. This, we, we share, what we share are sort of structural relationships, um, visions of the future, um, stories about the past. Like, I can't remember how he put it. But he basically ended up by saying, and you see this in Fanon's life, you know, that solidarity is a choice that people make. And I, I, I choose to believe that that is a choice that people will very often make, not always, um, in defiance of governments for whom that is an inconvenient set of choices. And I think, I mean, sitting, I mean, again, sitting next to this, to this guy and his stories about, you know, some of the people who did not survive those journeys or to, like, who relied on these sort of relationships and this defiance of, you know, Barbados and Vincentian authorities and so on. You know, I just thought like, these were really stories of, they were, they, this was, a, there were stories of solidarity and they were stories of, um, of a different imagination of what it could feel like to live here. You know, what kinds of connections we could have in the Caribbean. And as a, pers as a person from the Lesser Antilles, and the Lesser Antilles is particularly, because it's so chopped up by jurisdiction, like there's a place in Martinique that has the same name as the town that my mother's from. It's called, my mother's from St. Peter in Barbados, and there's a St. Pierre in Martinique. In the north of Martinique, it's very similar. Like you could, if you, someone dropped you there, you could think you were in one place or the other. But, you know, as a person with a Barbados passport going up, like I couldn't just go to St. Pierre, even though it's right there. And I just think, you know, there are all these ways in which the people of this region just constantly imagine a different kind of formation of citizenship. Um, and governments have been unable to destroy that and in some ways rely on it for their, they turn a blind eye for their own legitimacy. So in that, I do think there, there is a different future coming. Um, what it looks like, you know, I can't say. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your thoughtful responses. I know they're really long, I do do that. Oh, oh I'm, so I, if I could say one small thing. The title, so I changed the word in the title at the last minute, and I did actually think of changing, putting reparatory instead of Revol um, revolutionary, and I was like, well, no, they'll get the point in the talk. It's like, it doesn't matter. But I did think of it, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Before people run off, <laughs> I have one question for Professor Newton as well, just a final question. Um, I think building off of what you were just talking about, I think we spent so much of Black History Month thinking backwards yeah. and remembering, but I wanted to think forward and ask you a little bit about dreaming 
and um, here in the Canadian context, but in the Americas as a whole, when you dream forward and you think of black and indigenous solidarity and solidarity across other racialized lines, what does that look like to you? Wow. What does that look like? Huh. Well, I always say to my students, you know, that history is about teaching people to see connections that in a different and better world would be obvious, but which have been hidden you know, by the structures of power under which we live. <sighs> to me, actually, I mean, honestly, I will keep going. It, it looks like this, this moment. And, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay, I'm, not, I'm almost done, I'm worried. Yeah, so you saved me from having to answer this question because, yeah, I, I don't know. To me, I, I think that of how I felt in that moment, and I would say, this is what it looks like to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all for staying with us. I know we will be on time, but thank you so much for coming. I just want to remind you all that on February, February 19th, we have Dr. DeAndre Smiles, a black and indigenous scholar coming to McGill to talk. So we encourage you to re come out to that. And thank you all for coming again. Take care. Have a good night.